In this video, we study the relationship between ecology as a subfield of science and environmentalism. The naive view that your book starts with is this idea that ecology is just the science of environmentalism. So environmentalism is a movement and ecology is just the science of it. Uh, and the slightly more nuanced version of this is that ecology is the science behind what's called the Gaia hypothesis. So the Gaia hypothesis is the idea that the earth is a sustaining mother to all living things. Um, another way of saying it is that living organisms interact with the inorganic surroundings of them to form a synergistic, complex, self-regulating kind of system, which is uh, the earth together with all of the organisms on it, um, and that this together helps perpetuate the conditions for life. We'll return to the Gaia hypothesis at the very end of the lecture, but um, you can see how um, the naive view might think that ecology is just the science that's going to ground that kind of hypothesis. We and your book are going to reject this idea that ecology is just the science behind environmentalism. But if we say that, if ecology isn't the science behind environmentalism, how are they different and what are the different approaches that they take? So ecology is the science that seeks to describe and understand the relationships between organisms and their environment. Environmentalism, on the other hand, is a movement, and it's a movement that warns of the dangers posed by humanity's powerful efforts to exploit the world and its inhabitants through industry and through intensive agriculture. We can put these in like a little Venn diagram, so environmentalism and ecology. Environmentalism, as I just said, is this movement against unrestricted exploitation of resources. And ecology is a science that's going to understand the relationships of organisms in the environment. The thing that they share that goes in the center is a concern about the earth. But the idea is that environmentalism has like a holistic view or a... Um, more general concern about the earth and oftentimes will um, be against any kind of human interference in the earth. But ecology wants to understand what that interference is like and how human interference can be used um, to improve the environment. Okay, so here's another image of uh, the same kinds of ideas. So environmentalists are going to say human interference in nature is potentially damaging to the earth as a whole. Ecologists are going to say that we need more careful management of nature to allow for resource renewal, and they're going to study what those relationships might look like. Before we transition to looking at environmentalism and ecology um, in their own right, I'm going to have a brief intermission uh, about some of the philosophical ideas that were introduced in this chapter. They went pretty quickly, so I just wanted to address the um, general movements that the chapter describes and then give you some examples of what that looks like. So we have in the chapter, we describe holism, reductionism, mechanism, materialism, and vitalism. Some of these are antonyms of one another and some bear certain relationships to one another, but they're, all, they're not all connected in simple ways. And so let's go through each of these in turn and see um, what the relationships are starting with holism and reductionism. So holism is this idea that the parts of a system can't be understood without reference to the whole of a system. The idea, the catchphrase is oftentimes that um, the whole can be reduced to its parts, or when you put the parts together, you get something more than just some of the parts. Reductionism, on the other hand, is that a system can be represented in terms of its simpler parts. So you can easily represent the whole of a system just by looking at the parts and putting those individually together is what gets you the whole. So these exist on a scale. So um, you might have more holistic or less reductionistic kinds of approaches or the opposite, more reductionistic and less holistic. So they are antonyms. Let me give you an example of what this looks like. Suppose you want to look at a system of birds. A very strong reductionist will say, we'll just look at the individual birds of the system and see what they're doing. And then you can add up the sum of what they're doing to get the whole of what a flock of birds might be doing. 
Uh, someone in the middle might say, well, look at some chunks of this. So look at some conglomerations of birds and see how they interact. Um, and then you can sum those up into the bigger flock and see what's going on in the bigger flock. A holist will say, none of that makes sense. What you need to do is look at the whole of the system, which cannot be reduced to just the simple parts. A flock of birds is an interesting case because we often see emergent patterns. Um, the flock itself is an emergent pattern, so it takes on this kind of unique shape that can't be reduced to the action of individual birds. And so it might be a good example of where you might want to take a holistic kind of approach to the problem. Uh, but again, a reductionist won't do that. They'll just say, look at what each individual bird is doing, and the flock behavior is just uh, the sum of the behavior of the individual birds. So that's holism and reductionism. Let's now do mechanism. So mechanism is the idea that natural holes, or living things usually is what people are talking about, are similar to complicated machines or artifacts composed of parts lacking any kind of intrinsic relationship to one another. The analogy people will often use is to clocks or to watches, um, and so there you have all these individual parts that uh, lack relationship to one another but um, stand to like perform some function in the, in the clock itself. And our final two are materialism and vitalism. So materialism is the idea that all natural phenomena can be explained by physical causes. There is nothing non-physical in the world. So if you want to think about like mind-body dualism, that the mind or the soul exists separate from the body, a materialist will staunchly reject that idea. Uh, so when we think of materialism, the first thing that comes to mind is often a materialism that's connected to consumerism. So materialism in the sense that, oh, all you care about is the material comforts of life, or all you care about are your objects or possessions. Um, and in a sense, this is kind of connected. So it's saying all that matters are physical objects, not anything beyond that. And so when somebody gets critiqued for being too materialistic, they're like, oh, you don't care about the experiences of life or something like that. Um, and so they're similar, but slightly different uses of this term materialistic. And vitalism is the idea that living organisms are different from non-living entities. Living organisms contain some kind of non-physical element or are governed by different principles than inanimate um, or non-living entities. Um, so you can see that these stand in direct opposition with one another because non-physical element would be against the materialist thesis. Um, so if we want an illustration, consider um, comparing plants and rocks, a vitalist would reject the idea that plants and rocks are similar. So again, these exist on a scale or they're antonyms of one another. Okay, so now we have all of the different theories and we want to consider what their relationships are. So remember that holism and reductionism are antonyms. And we also know that vitalism and materialism are antonyms. Um, we also know that mechanism implies reductionism. So mechanism, remember, was this idea that things are like watches or the living objects are like uh, mechanical objects. And therefore, we should be able to reduce all mechanical objects to their simple parts. Now, importantly, reductionism does not imply mechanism because it's not necessary if you're a reductionist to think that everything operates in that kind of mechanical or mechanistic way, uh, but mechanism does imply reductionism. Um, we also know that if you're a mechanist, you can't be a holist. So um, this is just because if me mechanism implies reductionism, then it can't also imply holism, right? It has to imply the opposite because holism and reductionism are opposites. Okay, and then one more from mechanism. Mechanism also implies materialism. If you're a mechanist, there's no more to an object besides these smaller mechanical parts. Um, you have to be a materialist. There's no other thing beyond those mechanical parts at play. Um, but if you're a materialist, that doesn't necessarily mean, again, that you're a mechanist. There's other ways of being a materialist that don't imply that everything fits together like this nicely constructed machine.
And our final relationship is between mechanism and vitalism. Again, if mechanism implies materialism, it cannot imply vitalism. We're now in a position to talk about environmentalism. Environmentalism of the sort we're considering today emerges from early 1700s and 1800s attempts at exploiting the natural world. And so, as your book describes it, all these European countries were going around um, exploring various other regions and really just taking the natural resources, oftentimes, from those regions. Uh, so, for some concrete examples, you can consider the voyage of the HMS Beagle, famously the one that Darwin was on, and similar voyages of the time. Their goals were to identify and to classify animals and plants of these remote regions, uh, partly that was Darwin's mission, right? But also to identify locations and territories to colonize and to gather resources from. In particular, one of the recent resources gathered was the cinchona plant. So this was brought from South America and it was used as an anti-malarial drug because it contained quinine. Uh, so that allowed um, the finding of malaria, but uh, later you might recognize quinine because it's a key ingredient in tonic water. Uh, but anyway, so these European settlers were going to various remote regions and gathering up these natural resources. George P. Marsh, in his book Man and Nature, published in 1864, writes, The earth is fast becoming an unfit home for its noblest inhabitant, the human, and another area of such human crime would reduce it to a condition of impoverished productiveness, of shattered surface, of climatic excess as to threaten the deprivation, barbarism, and perhaps even extinction of the species. This is an 1864 note. It's not a contemporary um, writing about climate change, but it has uh, notes that you might expect to see today. So this kind of uh, language leads to later efforts to try and maintain some of the um, diversity in species, in landscape, etc. So it leads to more political efforts to try and um, curb the exploitation of resources. Um, later romantic thinkers like Henry David Thoreau in his book Walden on Walden Pond um, celebrate the celebrate nature and there's a rise of this kind of romanticization of nature um, and they often see mechanism as a key component to unrestricted exploitation so mechanism was a pretty prominent philosophical standpoint at the time and they see that kind of mechanism um, opposed to the romanticism that they're advocating for Later developments include in the 1890s, the Sierra Club is formed, and then in the U.S. in the 1910s, the National Park Service is created. Along these lines, uh, here is a newspaper advertisement circa 1910 for winter-tired girls to go to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, this is put in the newspaper by the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, and then in this context is when Silent Spring in 1962 is written by Rachel Carson. And we're gonna be reading that for our Thursday session. So I won't discuss it here, but you'll see, um, but now you know the context for the publication of that book. So that concludes our quick lesson on environmentalism, but you can see how um, early environmentalists were really worried about the exploitation of resources. Later environmentalists wanted to set out spaces to preserve those resources, like form the National Park Service, make national parks, etc. And then even later, environmentalists like Rachel Carson were worried about the impact of industry on humans living in those regions. Um, okay, so now we're going to turn to ecology as a subfield of science. The pre-origins of ecology, so before ecology was really a field, uh, can be dated back to Carl Linnaeus. So Linnaeus, you may have heard of from taxonomies. So he's the father of the taxonomy, especially of animals, but he was also interested in plants. So this taxonomy that goes like do domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, was an invention of Linnaeus, who was really interested in the balance of nature and predator-prey relations. Since ecology wasn't a field of science, he was really doing botany, 
and zoology. Botany has to do with plants, zoology with animals, so he had this um, interest in taxonomy for them both. So now moving on to the origins of ecology itself, there are three main figures that we want to study. The first is Alexander von Humboldt. He is in the early 1800s and really approaches ecology from a geology standpoint. The second is Eugenius Warming. He is in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and comes from a background of botany into ecology. And finally, we have Frederick Clemens, who's a grassland ecologist in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Okay, so let's start with von Humboldt. His essay on the geography of plants is perhaps the world's first ecology text. He was German, um, Prussian at the time, later Germany, and he goes to Latin America to compare the flora and fauna to European specimens. So he compares distributions of vegetation in, on Latin American mountains to other mountain ranges across the world. In so doing, he's implying some kind of global connection between the biotic and abiotic realms. What this means is that he thinks that mountains or the abiotic realm contributes to vegetation or the biotic realm worldwide. In other words, based on Humboldt's, von Humboldt's work, biologists were pressured to think more about the way that the environment constrains native inhabitants in a region. After von Humboldt, though, um, Eugenius Warming and Frederick Clements were really focused more on experimentation, and so their methods are going to be different from von Humboldt's in an effort to increase the experimentation happening because ecology is being more pushed to be a science and experimentation is seen as the hallmarks of good science. Eugenius Warming writes this book, Ecology of Plants, and it's the first book to ever have ecology in its title. The aim of the book is to explain how nature solves similar problems similarly. So how it solves problems like drought, flooding, cold, etc. in a similar fashion despite having very different raw materials in the different regions of the world. Um, in other words, he's saying like, how is it that nature in this area with these species solves the problem of drought similarly to how it solves it in this other area with these other species? The lasting impact of Warming's work is in terms of natural communities, that is, networks of interactions amongst plants characteristic of particular environments, so how these plants interact with one another. The last figure we want to study um, in the origins of ecology is Frederick Clements. Frederick Clements was really Im influenced by the Dust Bowl era in the US, and I'm showing you images of the aftermath of the Dust Bowl. This was a time when dust storms raged in the, U in the American and the Canadian Midwest, the 1930s, and the causes were drought overplowing, and a general lack of application of dryland farming techniques. This was crop rotation and cover crops. Crop rotation was just making sure that you rotated the crops not to, so as not to deprive a region of the same resources over and over with the same crops. And cover crops were crops that you would plant that would grow quickly but would sort of keep the um, land or the, um, the soil uh, in a region uh, from being blown away in a dust storm. Um, you might wonder, why was it called the Dust Bowl? Well, if we look at where the area that was impacted was, so it was in this region, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. If you overlay a topographical map of the U.S., you can see that there's two big mountain ranges that would constrain this region, and it sort of falls in the valley between them, and so that's why it was known as the Dust Bowl. Back to Clements, so Clements is looking at the impacts of the Dust Bowl circa the 1930s, and he's wondering what was going on. And so he's obviously motivated by very different concerns than any Europeans would have been. But he's also dealing with really different land layout, so the land is much vaster than the European ecologists would have been studying. And so he ends up inventing and using really different methods to study the land. 
what he does is he marks out squares what he calls the quadrants and then clears them of all vegetation allows the natural vegetation to come back and then literally counts all of the plants that end up growing in an, in that area now it's noteworthy here that this wouldn't be possible in a much more um in a richer kind of vegetation environment like if you had trees for instance he would have to wait a really long time for them to grow back so it wouldn't really be possible to do but because he's in this grassland area where everything grows pretty quickly he's able to employ this technique here's the results of his technique he's literally marking out regions in which different very specific plants are growing I recently learned that there's actually a national park that's made to preserve some of this wildlife in Kansas. Uh, so most of this area has at some point been taken over as farmland, uh, but this region in Kansas has always re remained natural and hasn't been um, turned into farmland in its history. And so you can go visit it to see all the prairie tall grass and the ecosystem there. So at this point, ecology is really set as a science. So in 1913, the British Ecological Society forms, and that's the first ecology society. But then later, there's the Ecological Society of America that forms the ESA in 1915. With the formation of the ESA, the publication The Plant World um, is recast into a new publication, uh, Ecology, in 1920. Um, and Ecology is the publication of the uh, Ecology Society of America. But there are still later developments in ecology that we want to study that have contributed to the uh, contemporary subfields of ecology that your book mentions. Uh, in particular, the three figures we're going to look at are Warder Clyde Alley, Charles Elton, and Arthur Tansley. Um, so let's start with Warder Clyde Alley. He's interested in animal ecology in the 1900s, and he actually is going to work from and reject uh, Darwinian evolution. So what Darwin says is that evolution prompts competition. So animals um, compete for the resources and evolution favors those who do well. Uh, and Warder Clyde Ely is going to say, actually, evolution prompts cooperation between species to help one another do well and propagate their species. And so he rejects this Darwinian idea. Um, as in a sense, this is a holistic kind of approach, but it's not a vitalistic one. Um, so Ali adopts a holism in, in looking at this cooperation, but again, not a vitalism. Ali inspires what is later uh, cemented as a subfield of ecology known as systems ecology. Systems ecology studies a lot of um, interactions between different aspects of the environment, feedback loops um, that often have to do with energy. And so it's this um, com combination of thermodynamics, of um, concerns with biotic feedback loops, concerns with abiotic feedback loops, um, atmospheric science, etc., etc. So it's a holistic approach to understanding ecology. That is why we think of it as a holistic approach to understanding ecology. It combines all these different fields and says you can't understand the way a tree is growing without understanding all of these other feedback loops that are in the background. Okay, so Contra Ali was Charles Elton and Arthur Tansley's approaches to ecology. So what they do is they deny the existence of a natural ecosystem concept. And so they, what they say is that there's no natural ecosystem that char that's characteristic of any environment. Rather, um, the natural world can be adjusted to any environment through planning. They reject that kind of um, mys mysticism or naturalism. Um, or we might call it vitalism, in favor of materialism instead. They inspire later developments in ecology, and in particular, the mathematization of ecology. Um, and this mathematization we might think about as being a reductionist attitude or a mechanistic attitude. It's reducing um, complex relationships to simpler ones that can be mathematically described, and it's also, in so doing, characterizing some mechanisms for the properties seen. 
So along come Alfred Lodka and Vito Volterra, uh, known for the Lodka and Volterra equations, who really mathematicize and therefore mechanize um, ecology. The Lodka Volterra equations just outline a model in which you have the population of a predator and the population of, a, of the prey tracked through time. So if we look at this little figure, what we see is that as we track through time, the relation between the predator and the prey population is linked. So here's the start. Suppose we look at just the predators. If the predators on a, are on a decrease, that means there's less predators around, we see that the prey is on an increase. There's less stuff eating the prey, so of course the population is going to rise. But as the prey increase, we see that the predators start to increase as well. There's a small lag, of course, because it takes time for the predators to reproduce um, and so to have more predators around. Well, once the predators have increased, that means that the prey will now decrease because there's more predators eating them. And so we've reached the full cycle here, so we're at the bottom of the prey uh, curve, which is where we actually start. So we just repeat this process over and over. So the Lotka and Volterra equations really outline the relation between the predator and the prey population in an area over time. In so doing, what they've done is reinforce Darwinian competition-centric ideas. So the predator and the prey are competing, um, and so we see this uh, mechanism of Darwinian competition at play. These figures, starting with Tansley and Elton, and then later Lodka and Volterra, influence and lead to the development of subfields of ecology known as community ecology and sociobiology. These subfields are themselves based on Darwinian principles of struggle, competition, exclusion, etc. So those are the different approaches in ecology today. We saw systems ecology and now we see community ecology and sociobiology. Okay, so contra all of these approaches is this Gaia hypothesis. The Gaia hypothesis, as I described it before, is this idea that the whole Earth is a self-regulating system, including all the plants, animals, etc. that are on it, the entirety of it self-regulates. So this is a holism, but it's also a vitalism, and it's a vitalism in a way that ecologists outright rejected. So James Lovelock was obviously influenced by environmentalist movements, and he his proposal for the Gaia hypothesis was seen by ecologists as a return to mysticism and vitalism. And so he, his proposal is very bluntly rejected by ecologists, which again serves as a reminder that ecology is not the science of environmentalism, otherwise eco um, ecologists would have embraced Lovelock's proposal. Okay, so let's return to this general question, what is ecology? What we've learned in this lecture is that some approaches to ecology may be influenced by environmentalism, but they're very clearly separable. And in particular, any kind of vitalism that environmentalists might want or might propose is um, outright rejected by ecologists. Historical analysis has shown us that there are a lot of different approaches to ecology and that these approaches are based on different contexts or concerns that their, um, that their creators might have, the context in which they're living, the concerns of those regions. Um, and then finally, we've seen that ecology isn't really a unified science as of yet, but there are various ways of studying the interactions between the biotic and abiotic realms. There's different philosophical standpoints that might lead you to different ways of approaching ecology, but no matter which one you're in, you want to study this interaction between the biotic and abiotic realm as an ecologist.